and visioner of the Fanero Ministries. And this is a movement that is bringing a massive revival in the country of Uganda and in East Africa. An anointed man of God and has a very solid rooted background in the word of God. Let's rise to our feet and welcome for his first session this morning, Apostle Grace. Hold it. One, one second. And he's here with his mother and his sister. I know when someone brings their mother and sister family, then it means that they are really accepting and embracing you. Thank you for doing that. God bless. Praise the Lord. Come on, tap your neighbor on the left and on the right and tell them this is the best meeting in the world. Tell somebody there is nothing like wolf back on the face of the earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Last year. Last year when I came here, my mom, when I went back, she said, what is Wolfpack? I told her everything. And she told me, next year, I'm going with you. So my mom is here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's my singular honor. I'm so honored and blessed not only to know Pastor Pojo and his beloved wife and the family of this wonderful ministry. But I also celebrate them and whatever God has placed on their lives for our generation. I thank God for their resilience and commitment to get the gospel to those that must hear it. I thank God for their fatherhood and motherhood spirit because they are not intimidated by graces, ranks, or anointings. That kind of humility for a man to sit back and allow others to take his altar. It takes a great, great dealing with God. Come on, let's celebrate that. I'm also going to thank God for every minister that has ministered on this altar. This is what I believe, that every minister has a message for somebody in the room. One might have a message for somebody in the corner, and the next one might have a message for somebody in the overflow, but whatever it is, we celebrate that this was divinely orchestrated to make sure that everybody who comes to Wolfpack goes back with a message. Hallelujah. So I celebrate every man and woman that has stood on this altar, and I have prayed to God to give me the utterance and grace only to add and not to take away from what has been planted in Jesus' mighty name. Let's worship God in just a minute and then we get into the word. As we seek your face, may we know
thank you for the theme that you've chosen because indeed it's credible for the hour. And I must decrease. And you must increase. Speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's get our seats. Hallelujah. I'll say in the very words of Luke that many have taken the responsibility to set in line the things that are most truly believed among us concerning this mystery called faith. And I'm so excited that this was the topic that was chosen. Faith that moves mountains. But today I'm going to take you to another dimension of this thought. Something I believe that when we are defining this thing called faith has been sadly, grossly misunderstood, misrepresented, or not spoken of as it ought to because we are worried or concerned with the confusions in the nuances, in the communication. But the word of God still abides true. You know, it's like if you've met a false prophet and then you say, oh, no, let's write up the whole prophetic movement. That would be wrong because there are prophets existed in the world and are speaking as God has assigned. Are you following? So in what I want to share tonight again, this is one of those examples of those things that could be abused, grossly misrepresented, but is a fact and has been defined before time and will always exist as a fundamental law of building our faith in God. And it's in Hebrews chapter 6, the 12th verse. The Bible says, be ye not slothful. The word there, slothful, means slow. You can be slow. It's possible to do things slow. It's possible to build a ministry slow. It's possible to run a business, but that business is running slowly. It's possible to establish a project but you're not moving at the speed that you ought to move at. God says that if you need some supernatural momentum, he has given us a fundamental law, and he says, but be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit promises. God gave us a very distinctive law in connecting to faith. He said, you might be slow, in an aspect in life. But I have given you one antidote, one of the things you could do in the many other things we are going to preach in this conference. This is a very important aspect that should not be ignored. God said, there are people in your life that I've set before you and I have put a pattern on them that if by wisdom and grace you might learn how to be a follower of these people, I will quicken you. This portion of scripture of Hebrews that we're all reading from Hebrews 1, by faith we know and understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. From defining what faith was, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, the Bible says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. And what did God do? He gave reference to people. He gave reference to Abraham. He gave reference to Enoch. He gave reference to Moses. He gave reference to Sarah. And through, through Hebrews from the 11th verse, verse 1, 11th chapter, verse 1 to the last verse, you see God giving references of men and women who walked this path and won. And the very Paul who is giving reference to these men takes you back a bit in Hebrews chapter 6 and tells you, be ye followers of them. Be ye followers of them. You know, the Bible says that we regard no man in the flesh, and that's the truth. But the Bible did not say that we don't regard men in the spirit. Praise the Lord Jesus. There are certain things in life that God has designed for you to receive 
from men who carry the very things. It's an undeniable fact that if you want to build a template, a blueprint, or a pattern of consecration, God has given us two things very distinctly in Scripture that every man should know and understand how they work. And one, the oscillation is between building bonds and alliances with people God has given the graces in the age, the very graces we venerate, the very graces we esteem and want to attract. It's important that you know how to connect to the spirit of a person who carries the very anointing that you are admiring or pursue in God. On the other side, he has given the pendulum to studying the ancients, to understand those that have gone before us. Because some of us, I'm one example of people which were greatly impacted by studying the ancients. We fell on, if I may call them, quote and unquote, dead bones. It was like the Elisha experience where they bring a, 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 a dead man and they throw him on his bones and that man leaves. Because we had or felt convictions and assignments of God that when we looked around, we didn't see the blueprints as defined clearly as we had seen with some of the ancients. And so you give your life and heart to study these people to understand what they did and how they did whatever they did. And I can give you story upon story, testimony upon testimony. I'll give you one or two of them so you understand this. One of those days, the Lord led me to study a woman called Maria Woodworth Etta. And he told me, study her for a pattern. Many of you don't know that woman. And then I took time to study Maria. And I studied her, I studied her, I studied her. Little did I know that something was coming upon my life that I did not know how to define. And I remember that very day, uh, I was, you know, after a period of studying this lady, one of those days, I'm invited to a meeting to preach somewhere, and something remarkable I had never seen happen. I get on that altar, I open the text that I'm supposed to preach from, read three or four lines, and the power of God hit the whole building. Every man and woman in that building was slain, and nobody could move a muscle for three hours. And so I sat there watching what God was doing until the Spirit told me, leave and go home. There is, you have no business here. You've done what has to be done. So I go home, and they call me after a couple of hours and tell me what had transpired. Nobody could move under the anointing. And so I remember, I said, God, what is this new, new thing you have placed on me? And he told me, as you studied her spirit, I saw the desire in your heart, and I got a portion of what worked on her and placed it on your spirit. This is a conversation our generation does not know how because you are never taught the principles of how to connect to graces. And the challenge with that kind of uh, testimony in our generation is that we are going to get to a point where we cannot replicate what we've seen our forefathers do. Nigeria, you were blessed once to have a man like Reinhard Bonke doing a meeting of four, three, five million people on the ground. But if all that observed this man do this thing could only, you know, admire what was being done but could not connect to the grace working on Reinhard Bonke, then you must have not understood fully that this man did not come to this nation only to win souls, but he came to leave a mantle. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible has said God has allowed you to be followers of them who through faith have inherited promises and patience. Be a follower. Understand how to build a pattern around the people that you know have been anointed by God and by His grace have been positioned in certain places in your dispensation. Because whether you want it or not, the Bible says that the eunuch, he can't be born a eunuch. But he says, but there are some which are made eunuchs by men. That your consecrations might not come from you going on a mountain to seek God for 20 or 30 years. There are things you might get on a mountain, but it takes a very high level of pride to go to a mountain to seek what another man has. Let me say it again. It takes a very high level of pride to seek what another man has. And certain graces and positions in the spirit, the way God has ordained and ordered them, are only received by submitting and learning to serve a certain pattern. When you look at the prophets that were in Israel in the time of Elijah, there were many prophets. In fact, if you remember, some prophets were prophesying in the life of Elisha. 
But little did all these prophets know that Elijah was not just a prophet. He was the horseman and chariot thereof. He was not just a keeper of the gates of Israel. He had a throne and a position in the spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Now, Elisha serving Elijah was not just serving another prophet. He was serving a mantle. And that's why we see at the end of that story, Elisha connected to the very mantle that Elijah had, the horseman and chariot of Israel. Now, whether you want it or not, this man was elevated in a certain place of functioning in a face that was not conventionally the way we explain how to connect to graces. But all we know is that when he crossed that river back and casts the mantle on the water, this man came out with a double anointing because he knew how to connect to that grace. We have an indifferent generation that is so proud to seek and submit itself to such patterns and they think, uh-uh, I don't want what's on this and I cannot get, oh, if you got it this way, no, I don't care. Let me go on my mountain and seek God and try to seek to do something or replicate what he is doing. Yet God says, it's in the ambits of your humility that I will call you to say, yield and submit to what is working on this man because he just knows how. I remember the first time I healed a sick. I was in a meeting once somewhere and a man walked to a lady which was crippled and laid hands on her and I observed it with my eyes and something came on my life. And I remember I flew back to the country and looked for any crippled person there was. And I, in that meeting in an overnight, I found a man who had a freshly broken leg. Broken leg. Broken. And I laid hands on the man and for the first time he walked. I'd never seen that, but this impartation came on my spirit because I observed a faithful one. Are you following what I'm saying? When Jesus was being prophesied over the things that should be, the Bible says many wondered at the things that were spoken of this Christ. But Mary, the Bible says, kept these things in her heart. Now, would it surprise you why Mary is the first person to get a miracle? Out of the timing of heaven. Because even when she comes to Jesus Christ, and tells him they are without wine. He says, woman, what do you want with me? Knowest not that it's not yet my time to do miracles. She turns to the servants and says, do what he tells you to do. In other words, I'm not ready to take this. I have learned a principle and pattern through you by faith. I observed certain things and I've kept them in my spirit. I've just, stat just stated them. I have consumed them and I understand how you work. Whether it's the timing of God or not, a miracle must happen and I have the jurisdiction to do so because of the qualification I've earned by how I have observed you as my son. The first miracle happened before the timing of heaven because she knew how to follow a certain pattern. Certain things went to her heart while some things went to the heads of others. And I pray that while we're preaching this thing, you don't just go back with the excitement in your head, but something will be planted in your spirit to receive of every grace coming on this altar. Every man and woman of God coming to this altar. You are so blessed because now you have examples and patterns. I saw dancing here. That's a pattern of some, uh, the, the psalmist. And there's a worshiper here right now listening. And they're simply enjoying this man's songs. Instead of connecting to the thing that defines who he is, connecting to the thing that gives him that kind of sound and vibration in the spirit, that thing that consecrated his voice and separated it from the noises of the many people who all sing but have not yet learned to worship. So when we bring things like Wolfbeck, it means this is a collection of graces coming together for you, not only to be, listen, this is not a meeting to get a job and a house and a car. Don't ask for things money can buy. Ask for things money cannot buy in this conference in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout hallelujah. I remember studying Kenneth e. Hagin when I was a young man. God told me, read everything he has written, listen to everything that has been recorded of his voice. And I read everything that was written, listen to everything recorded on his name. And I remember that day when the Lord told me, now I have extended the grace of demonstrating power as is on that man. And I know what started to happen. I saw limbs growing for the first time. One time we were in Entebbe preaching the gospel and I was with a few people here. And while I was preaching, there was a girl with a short leg. While I was preaching, the leg grew down. The people in the church could not contain the excitement. Even the worship was interrupted. But I can connect and realize that there are people God has put certain things into. And those are the very things some of you need. You don't need to go to a mountain. Some men carry the thrones that you're seeking for. 
and you just need to know how to submit yourself to the process and connect to the graces. I think this is the one thing that I learned very early. I know how to partake of a grace. If we had time, we'd teach only that, how to partake on a grace that, that works on a minister. Because you see, you must get firstly to a plate of, of separating your lust from understanding the assignment and purpose of God on your life. So you're simply not just admiring what is functioning on a woman or a man, but you understand the weight and responsibility of the heart in why he ordained that man or woman and placed them before you to learn. Paul tells the people he's with, he says, for you see my ways which be in Christ. You can study my pattern and see how things are working. Hallelujah, praise God. But this begins firstly with having the right estimate of yourself. Because I have always emphasized even in my ministry that some of the challenges we see in, in ministers, like the Bible says in Hosea, how uh, Ephraim is a, a bread not turned, how some ministers look incomplete in the way of life is because there was a conflict in the orientations of divine thought, in their foundation of life as they started this thing called ministry. There were missing gaps in this process and many of them have matured to such a place where the positions that they carry both by man and God are so hard to bend and they would only have to bend these positions for them to connect to the gaps that they missed. And that is why it's important for us to make sure that when we are preparing people for ministry, they receive everything. Somebody says, God cannot take you when you're not prepared. That's not true. Look at Moses. Was Moses ready when God sent him? A man who is ready would not ask, who are you who is sending me? What should I tell them about you who has sent me? Oh, I stammer. I cannot speak. Oh, will they believe me? No, that's not a man who is ready. That's not a man who is ready. If you read scripture from the time he kills an Egyptian and buries him in the sand, God never spoke to Moses for about 40 years. He never spoke to him. But sometimes I have seen that there are even instances where because you are chosen of the Lord, God can position you in a place to send you on an assignment even when you're not fully ready because the time of that assignment has met a ready heart. The heart could be ready, but you're not prepared as a minister. And remember, God looks at the heart first before your preparedness. Paul says, not many of us were wise. Not many of us were noble. Not many of us were of honor. You don't need to be perfect to be used by God, but you need to have a certain heart to be used by God. Are you following what I'm saying? But where does this begin from? It begins with having firstly the right estimate of yourself, of your weight in the spirit. Because all of us are represented by ranks and weight in the spirit. And I have seen that there are people who might miss the impartations they need because they think they are in places where they are not. How many people can weigh themselves? The Bible says examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Examine yourselves. Prove your own selves, he says. Otherwise, the Bible says you'll become reprobates. But this is a place where we don't examine ourselves to see where am I spiritually? And if I'm this level spiritually, what do I need to take me to the next level? Because I, you see, I have realized this, and this is a truth infallible, that you can be confident yet indifferent. You can be confident yet delusional. Have you ever met people who are confident but delusional? Somebody is sure that they can do something they cannot do. In psychology, we have a term called Dunning-Kruger. Some of you who read psychology, you'll understand it. I did a little psychology. It's after a man who, and they studied some people, human beings, and they live in a world of so much deception in their own head that they are convinced that they can do something they actually carry no qualification for in the spirit. Have you been around somebody who says, let's run, and then you run? And after running, you win them and they say, let's do it again, I think I can beat you. And then you run the second time. And then you beat them and say, I still think I can beat you. That's not faith. That's Dunning-Kruger. 
that's a confident yet delusional individual. individual. And I've seen it with Christians. It's going to work. My marriage is going to work and it fails. My children are going to succeed. The pastor said it. The word was there. I have received it. Myself. Nothing can slow me. And then after a while, the results are contrary. Because in their confidence, they were delusional. Why? They carried not the substance. They carried not the evidence. Brother Selman yesterday was talking about the testimony. He was talking about carrying the, being a bearer of the testimony that even when test, things have not yet come and things are not yet working for you, you can still bear a mark of the spirit as one which has been not only dealt with by God, but as someone who has proved him over and over by the experiences you've received to know that even yet it's not revealed in my life, but I still carry the confidence in my spirit that God is in charge. That's a place of maturity. Not everybody can claim that position because I know people who have not even yet learned to walk in faith. And they say, oh, I'm failing because, you know, I bear testimony. And you want to ask this person, what testimony do you have? And some of them don't even understand it or carry it yet. Because this person has just entered the faith. They need to learn and study the journey. Somebody will quote Paul and say, oh, but Paul was buffeted. He was beaten by a messenger. A messenger was sent from hell to buffet his body. Well, read your scriptures in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7. Paul says, least I should be what? Exalted above measure, underline the word measure there, I'm going to come back to it. Through the abundance of revelations that was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Listen, this man was being buffeted because he knew too much. So you can't claim that portion of scripture when you have not even learned the first steps of revelation, you're still in the gestation period, you're, in, you're still in infancy, you're still in incubation, and all of that is a process because every man has gone through that, even the most mighty used by God had a process of incubation, but you are still in incubation period, you cannot speak of the testations of a man like Paul, who is being buffeted because of the abundance of revelation, because God needs to tame him, not to exercise himself beyond the measure that has been given by him, even to rich men. So, you don't Say, I'm also, I also have a messenger, you know, and God told Paul that his grace is sufficient, so even me, I claim the grace of God to be sufficient. You must first understand from where Paul spoke. At what level and rank he was at when he spoke. Because there is a price to every dimensional level that God has raised you. And I'll tell you the truth. Many of your leaders go through things some of you might never imagine. Are you following what I'm saying? So we must understand what I'm trying to say here as well. This is very important. When you go back to study Paul, he mentioned this thing very fundamental and he says, it was exalting myself beyond the measure. The word they are used for measure is also the assignment. In other words, Paul got so excited with the revelations on his life that he almost found himself pushing himself out of the places he was assigned by God because he carried the qualification spiritually to step in those places. Ouch! A man can exercise himself beyond measure. He says something in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13. He says, but we'll not boast of things without our measure, again, without our assignment, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. We don't exercise ourselves beyond the grace and assignment he has given to us to reach you. And these are the heathen. These are the Gentiles as was given to them and Barnabas while James, Peter, and John gave them that right hand of fellowship in Galatians chapter 2. And then James, Peter, and John stayed preaching to the circumcised as Paul stayed with Barnabas preaching to the uncircumcised. Are you following what I'm saying? That there are things that we might offend in because we are exercising ourselves beyond the measure. And there is a rule here, verses 14. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reached out not unto you. For we are come as far to you also in preaching the gospel.
gospel, not boasting of things without our measure that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, he says that we shall be enlarged by you according to the rule abundantly. He has introduced a rule called the rule of measure. He says we cannot expand our assignment outside the scope to which God has ordained us to function, but we can expand our territories spiritually. We can expand our crowns of influence as we continue to preach faith to those who are hearing us. You can expand, I repeat, your crown of influence spiritually, but you cannot extend yourself beyond the assignment God has placed on your life. Why? Because you feel that you carry the liberties of the spirit to expand and express yourself in certain dimensions because you carry the thought and understanding. I mean, you've been given so much. This is the challenge Paul was, am I communicating? This is the challenge Paul found himself into. And much as we're preaching about this faith to move mountains, we must understand that the mountains are moved in the jurisdictions of the measure with which God has placed on our lives. And we can only expand the territories of influence within that assignment. If you walk out of that assignment, I don't care how much faith you think you have, you are out of order. You might not be a prophet, but once in a while the Spirit of the Lord gives you impressions because the Bible says the Spirit will show you things to come. But you don't make a mistake that by faith, because you can see, therefore you're going to exercise yourself to push yourself in a place of standing in the office of the prophet. Leave certain things to prophets. We must carry that wisdom as well. Are you following what I'm saying? You might be a wonderful evangelist who gathers numbers and you heal the sick every day and because they are sick, they come to your church. But that doesn't mean you're a pastor. Are you following what I'm saying? And you might frustrate the grace operating on your life because you're out of the measure, the rule of the measure that God has given you even to reach men. Are you following what I'm trying to say? Are we together? There's so much silence in the room. Because you're understanding. Yes. Hallelujah, somebody. Yes. Hallelujah, somebody. Yes. He said, because every time you extend yourself in this rule of measure, you're entering another man's line and labor. But yet, this is a generation that has not yet understood this wisdom. I have been on altars preaching with very great and wonderful people. And I have wept in my heart in the place where we're supposed to be liberating territories. We found ourselves that certain men were fighting for the territories we're trying to liberate. And the altar which is supposed to be a place of liberating and setting men free is become an altar of contending and competing to show that I know more than the other person. Am I communicating? And we have a young gener younger generation that doesn't know the difference in what I'm saying. Because you need quite a lot of wisdom to address this disparity, this kind of imbalance. It takes a certain grace to understand what I'm explaining. This is the thing that sometimes find, uh, finds us in that confidence, but is deceived. Because we are out in of line with the principles and patterns God has given us to function under. Oh yes, we are going to talk about faith. But we must understand that our God is a God of patterns. Our God is a God of blueprints. Our God is a God of process. Our God is a God of order. Our God is a God of procedure. He has ways in which he works. The Bible says he made known unto Moses his ways and unto Israel his acts. Some people know what God does but they don't know how he does the things he does. And I have prayed for you in this conference that may God place on your spirit the understanding of knowing how he does what he does. You'll be a more efficient minister in the things of the spirit. A more efficient minister in the things of the spirit. He says, when your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged by you. If a pastor understood this, they can't have a small ministry. This statement. That if you increase the faith of men, you are enlarged even by them. Your ministry grows as you continue to express yourself in the pattern of the order and the measure to which God has given you. Ouch. 
Territories are not expanded because we expand ourselves beyond the measure. You know you can be excited in the things of the spirit. I've always told people in my church that I've seen people who are boiling with excitement. But they're excited because they're unstable. Paul called it a zeal that has no knowledge. When Joseph was talking about his sons, I mean Jacob, when he gathers them to prophesy or speak into their destiny, he brings out a son called Reuben. If you read the Amplified Version, I realize that a man can be cold, but a man can also be so hot and excited on zeal, but on a wrong foundation or principle. And Reuben is one example. The Bible says in the Amplified Version, if you read, he tells him that you are unstable and boiling over like water. And he tells them, you shall not excel and have the preeminence of the firstborn. You will lose your position in the spirit because you, you are boiling, but you're boiling over. You are excited. You do things out of the pattern and principle of God. You went and slept in your father's bed because you wanted to revenge against your father for not loving your mother Leah instead of loving, I mean, for not loving your mother Leah and yet loved Rachel. And when Rachel died, you ex Jacob extended the love he had for Rachel to his servant Bila and Reuben wanted vindication for having ignored his mother Leah instead of seeking God to know how this would work instead he went into his father's bed and defiled it he was boiling over he, he had a point why do you ignore my mother the, I, why, why, would, why don't you love her yes Rachel has died and it's the it's, it, she has been judged by some reason. But my mother is still alive and she bears your children. Why don't you love her? Why would you go for a slave? This is something Reuben would have taken to God. But instead, he boiled over. And he chose to use a carnal method to satisfy his, vengeance, his wrath. And his father said, you're boiling over. You'll not have the preeminence. You'll never excel have taken your position away as a firstborn. And if you study Hebrew pattern, the firstborn always carried the priestly. So he lost the priestly office. He lost the preeminence. He lost the kingly grace. He lost the preeminence. Why? Because it was boiling over. Now, yes, we're going to preach about faith that moves mountains. But this faith worketh through love. This faith worketh through some principles. We must know that the faith we're talking about also needs certain qualifications under to under God. At least we promise people things that they cannot manifest. And then somebody's going to go back and frustrated. Why didn't this work? Why didn't I receive the miracle? But pastor, you told me to do everything right now. I'll give you an example. We're talking about the faith to build or to make a billion dollars, right? Are you going to teach the faith to move the mountain of a billion dollar when you don't understand the principle of giving? Seed and harvest? Because you believe, you think you're going to move a certain dimension of the spirit when you have not understood that as Genesis says, for as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest. As long as the earth remaineth. As long as the earth remaineth, seed, time, and harvest are an indelible mark on earth. You're not going to ignore it because you have a lot of faith and say, I decree and I declare, by September 2024, I will have a billion dollars on my account. You're deceiving yourself. <laughs> Every man that I know and has made a wealth that is qualified has a pattern and a principle they have followed. Are you going to ignore the virtue of godly labor because you're spiritual? No, no, let me just sleep the whole day. A little sleep and a little slumber and poverty will pounce on your door. That's the problem with us. That's why the world thinks that we are confused because some Christians can't even apply common sense. Blame Pastor Pojo. He invited me. <laughs> Somebody shout amen. But nevertheless, God says, you might not understand me, but there are people who have my fruit, who have my results, 
who carry the vindication of the Spirit. This is the greatness of the mystery of godliness. The Bible says, he came in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit. That's very important, to be vindicated by the Spirit. For the Spirit of God to say, that woman is used of God. 1 Timothy 3.16. He says, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of the angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Every man walking this faith must carry the vindication of the spirit. There has to be a place in life where you'll stand and not need to say anything except the altar that you go to every week, every night speaks for you. There has to be a place in God where you don't need to explain so much, but the anointing on your life announces you the way it should announce you because you have a testimony, a covenant with God. Hallelujah, somebody. You're not trying out. You're not going in prayer to damage control. You're entering the place of prayer with the confidence that you know that you know that the God you're talking to you have had a relationship with for all of this while and there are things that you have learned of him. Hallelujah, child of God. Hallelujah, child of God. Are you learning something? But he says, I'll place certain people before you. And I'll tell you this, every child which is born in this world begins with the first stage of every child on the earth you have ever known, including every man listening to me. You began by imitating. You saw people walking, you walked. You saw people talking, you talked. You saw people singing, you sang. You saw people eating, you ate. If you were raised somewhere in a jungle, you'll do exactly what the monkey did. That is why when we are growing in the things of the spirit, we must emphasize that there are places you might be mature in, but there are things you're still a nepeo, a spiritual child. In the areas where you're still a child, humble yourself to imitate where somebody has gone ahead of you. And in some instances, listen, in some instances, you might be an adult in certain things and enter realms and find yourself a child in the very realm you have entered. Some see you as an adult, but in certain dimensions, you are actually a babe because you have found yourself in a place where certain people are functioning in a far distinctive grace than you're functioning in. Who understands what I'm saying? You are in a third world country and you have a million, uh, maybe half a million dollars and you say, hmm, <laughs> you're the boss. Everywhere you go, people say, yes, sir, sir. Then you go in a nation like America and you find billionaires. Did you get it? You find billionaires. In that world, you're, <laughs> you're still growing. You understand what I'm saying? Because you have found people doing things at the next level. So sometimes when we talk about being an infant, we don't necessarily mean that you are so young, but we are talking about the dimensions in which you enter because we grow in stages and we learn in phases and some people are in higher stages of the spirit than us or some are in the same stage with us but they're in higher phases. That makes us infants to them. If you're a good teacher of the world and you meet a man who can't teach but is healing the sick, you are to learn from him to heal the sick like he is to learn from you in the way of teaching if he's ordained to teach, if you're ordained to teach. You get it? But the humility to know that I might have this and I feel God has invited me to heal the sick and I don't know how, but there's a man I know who can do it. Let me imitate him. Imitation. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen, read the Amplified Version. Amplified version. Are you ready? Let's go. Pattern yourselves after me. Follow my example as I imitate and follow Christ the Messiah. Remember, this is the church of Corinth. You had the four churches, and everyone had their own degree of maturity. The youngest was Thessalonica, second youngest was Corinth. Then in there, you had Philippians, 
and the Ephesians, they were a bit more mature, and then, you know, the Macedonian fellows take over. You understand? Now, Paul is saying Corinth is a church that is growing. Even the language in Corinth, he's teaching them about giving, how to give, what the state of heart the man should have when they're giving. This is a learning church. And he's saying there are things you're learning. Imitate me. Imitate me even as I imitate Christ. Yes, I know you want to heal the sick, but when I'm healing the sick, observe how I heal the sick. Don't try to build your own altar somewhere and yet you can't express yourself in the spirit the way God has ordained the person he has ordained ahead of you to follow can express himself. Learn how he heals the sick. Learn how he speaks to wealth. Learn how he sees the way he sees. Learn his nuances. Look at him and study him every pattern of his life and know why does he look this way? Why does he do this? Recently was somewhere preaching and one of my sons observed something. I was, we're in London in a conference, and we're healing the sick, healing the sick after preaching. And then in the middle there, I stopped like this. And my heart is disturbed. And he could, he could tell that my heart, my spirit was disturbed. My spirit told me there's something missing here. And he was observing. I felt there was a miracle that had not yet broken out. And then in there while I was standing, I asked God certain things. I communicated to him. Those are private things. And God answered me. And then I turned and said, do we have anybody in a wheelchair or a clutch? And some people put up their hands. And I told them, get up and walk. They will tell you in that conference, nobody came with a clutch and didn't walk back home healed. This guy comes after service and asks me, what did you see? What was that thing that you saw in that moment? That's a son trying to learn. He's imitating. There's something he feels is a pattern, and he wants to connect to that pattern to say, what is this thing that you were doing at that particular point? Of course, there are many who observed and like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good meeting. Yeah, people were healed and stuff like that. But number one, not anybody who came with a clutch in that room walked back with a clutch. But two, something happened in that meeting that changed the atmosphere that a man studying me could have received. Do you get it? Uganda was a struggling nation. Pastor Robert Kayanja met a man called that Bishop Bethsoni Dahosa. Who says that everything I am was by Taylor's born and his wife, Daisy. This is the father of Nigeria saying, everything I am, it's quoted, was by Taylor's born and Daisy. That means he observed the pattern. It doesn't mean he couldn't heal the sick, but the dimensions he formed with certain individuals, and he knew he could only pattern himself a certain way to become the patriarch that Nigeria celebrates today. The Robert Kayanjas, our men of God, imitated the same, and we started to see very big revivals in our meetings. But who hasn't imitated? The, 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 the Taylor's Bones, Taylor's Bones is in a meeting of uh, William Branham, and then he sees a child with crossed eyes, and William heals that child. He receives the grace and goes to India and does his healing meeting for the first time after having tried to heal the sick for many years but he couldn't. But there was a man with a mantle and all he needed was to know how to connect. Am I communicating? Yes. Once they are mature enough, once you mature in that field, then express yourself above the standard the man has set for you. Because I always tell people, every man of God that has done something distinctive in his generation is a standard, not a limitation. Once you have drawn that standard and you know now I can meet this rank, then you go to Ephesians chapter 5, again the Amplified Version, verses 1. Now he's talking to the mature. He tells them, now that you've imitated people and you've gotten to a place where now you can fly, he says, therefore be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example as well, beloved children. Imitate their father. You see what I'm saying? Now he's saying, if, when you're at a level when you can do what I'm doing and you're my spiritual son, from then on, imitate God. But while there's still things you can learn from me, learn. And I'm speaking for every man and woman of God who stands on that altar. And you say, 
that they have something that you admire. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. Be imitators. Be imitators. Learn. Today we're in a generation where a person who has not built his anything can judge a man for building a house with small windows. The bathrooms are too small. Brother, first make enough money to buy a property in Abuja. Then judge a man for building a small house. Stand on the altar and walk that process for five, six years and then judge a pastor for doing this wrong, doing that man, doing this wrong. You know, some of you exercise yourselves in matters higher than you. You don't know where to say at this particular point, I can say nothing until I can build a template myself. Then I can express myself in a way to explain to the person who doesn't know how to do it, how to do it. You don't know how to drive, but you're telling the person, no, this is why you put indicator, put indicator now. <laughs> no, 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 overtake, overtake. Do you know how to drive? I don't know how to drive, but I know the theory. Overtake. <laughs> Shout fire. fire! Are you following what I'm saying? I want to finish. Oh no, we are going to teach faith. This evening you're going to walk on water. I'm going to teach something that will make you run mad. <laughs> but this was foundation to appreciate why Pastor Poju brings men of different graces from different parts of the world. He's saying, can somebody go back with every grace that stepped on that altar? Can you, because imagine what kind of man you'd become when you've connected to everything stepping here. Hallelujah, somebody. I want us to just take a few minutes and pray. I have eight minutes. I feel an impartation is happening in this room already. Come on, we have eight minutes. Somebody break out in the spirit and start to pray. Our generation needs something. There are things we see with the Papa de Boyes and the Oedipus that are not yet connecting. The Kenneth e. Huggins did things that are not yet connecting to our generation. We must connect to the wisdom of the ancient as well as those who are present but carry the grace of the dispensation. He was my cross You bore that I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness Come on, raise your voice from the innermost part of your being. And now my shame is gone. I stand amazed in your love and in my hope. Your grace calls on. Oh uh -huh. 
there's a person in this room and I feel in my spirit you receive a distinctive impartation on your spirit because you came for hung hungry for things only God can do you came for your generation you didn't come for your family you didn't come for your job you didn't come for your company you didn't come for your church you came for your generation there are apostles in this room right now the power of God is consecrating you There are prophets in this room. God is giving you a distinctive sound in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. There are worshippers here. God is giving you a distinctive sound in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the hour where you connect to the grace that has been released in your dispensation. And for every man and woman that carries it, I decree and I declare that God opens your heart to receive so you don't miss your time and your season. If you have received it, give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Come on, celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus.